Namaste, and welcome to our continuing series on the life divine with our beloved Ranga. We are on page 344, beginning with the line, It is evident that such a consciousness and will. It's better to know what he has said in the previous para, so I'll just tell you a summary of the previous para so that we get the continuity easily. So he has said in the previous para, the Supreme Spirit may be a mystery to us, but it is not an irrational freak without logic or without method. Okay? There is a method which is far. He, he says in other place, he, the Spirit uses the logic of the infinite. Man uses the logic of the finite. <laughs> so, the logic of the infinite. Man sees events and judges them by the results and some incomplete data. But the forces invisible to man also contribute to the final event, which we don't see. The subtle forces we don't see. Mental reason is partial, half blind. Spiritual intuition sees the whole. It takes into account external present actuals. Secondly, pre-existent actuals. Thirdly, dynamic actuals. We have discussed this last time, if you remember. The pre-existent actuals, that which is going to become a reality very soon. Dynamic, but it may not also become. Like we discussed, we gave the example of the seed on the table. It has got the potential to become a tree, but it will never become unless it becomes dynamic. So you have to put it in the ground and water it. That's exactly what somebody asked also. Mother also said that about the supermental. She said that when the supermental was brought down, okay, what she did was she made the possibility dynamic. Before that, the theoretical possibility was there. But when she brought it down, it is not yet an actuality for us. But one day it will become an actuality. So, it's a, now she has made into a dynamic actuality. It's only a question of time. Can you tell us what Sri Aurobindo means here by spiritual reason? Oh, that's, that's exactly what we can't discuss. <laughs> because the mind cannot understand spiritual reason. But when you go above, you see the links. You can say that. At our level... We judge something from the saying by seeing the results. And we say, oh, this is the result. You can guess that it could have come from there, it could have come from there. But always our reasoning is limited because we don't see the, the hidden forces. The hidden forces we don't see. Okay. At what level is spiritual reason? It starts from the higher mind. Ah, okay. It starts from the higher mind. As soon as you make your mind silent, your consciousness has gone outside the body-mind life and you start seeing much more. As I told you, his description of the normal mind is a candlelit room. You have to struggle to see things. You have to struggle to understand sentences in Sri You have to struggle to understand science, medicine. You have to concentrate and think out and be guided. So you have to struggle. But when you go to the higher mind level, it's like a broad daylight. You don't have to struggle. The galley slave labor, he uses the word galley slave labor, of the mind disappears. It's all there. All you have to do is to look. Okay? That's the uh, higher mind, uh, the, uh, the characteristic of the higher mind knowledge. It's a broad daylight. So, dynamic actuals. Possibilities which may or may not fructify Okay, imperatives in the process of manifesting finally the divine sanction to all events. The infinite consciousness is not a free caprice. Its method and logic are greater than ours. We gave an example also of how Sri Aurobindo is saying in 1920, 1922 actually, he told uh, Puranaji, India is going to be free. Mother said, she went even one step further and said, India is already free in the subtle world. It takes time for it to come down and become a reality here. 
just like the architect can plan the building that plan is going to become a reality is not it become a reality so it takes time for it to become a reality so all these things are determined all possibilities exist in the super mind as they keep descending they become more and more liable to be manifested and finally in the physical world there are some things which are manifested there are alternatives and there are things waiting to be manifested so all these possibilities that's what he is discussing okay so we don't see those things i gave a very uh, easy example like you are standing at the corner of the road and you see a fellow coming at full speed okay <laughs> on his motorbike like mad in pondicherry it happens okay <laughs> In fact, one day I tell you very funny. In Tamil, he was speaking in Tamil, but he was coming full speed. He knew he is doing something wrong, and he says, "Oh God, protect me!" <laughs> so, Kadavale, Kapatuko. That's what he said, and he came full speed, hoping that God will protect him. <laughs> so that sort of thing can happen in Pondicherry. So you feel that there is going to be, could be an accident, but if you are standing. On, and a car is coming from the other side they are going to have an accident but you don't see that because you are standing at the level of the road in the corner you go to the terrace in the corner you are seeing that car and you are seeing this fellow you know the possibility so you know much more so as you keep rising in consciousness even in physical space when you go up you see much more like we also discussed the satellites weather forecasting earlier we didn't know three days earlier we didn't know that a storm is going to come now three days four days before we can forecast that a storm is likely to come because the satellite is watching the cloud formation and telling you that this is going to happen so if you can go physically at a higher level and see things which you don't see on the ground level how much more it must be true in the spiritual consciousness that's what same they saying here in this para in a different way now we will start reading the para that we have to read today it is evident that such a consciousness and will need not act in harmony with the conclusions of our limited reason or according to a procedure familiar to it and approved of by our constructed notions or in subjection to an ethical reason working for a limited and fragmentary good so <clears throat> two things he is talking of constructed notions all our thoughts are constructions we have to think and in indian philosophy we say that the mental substance when you think of something when you think of a mountain your mental substance is arranging itself in the shape of a mountain then you understand so it's a construction and that construction can dissolve also in fact very often it dissolves when we are not concentrated and all sorts of ideas come in these constructions are coming in helter skelter and then but we have to learn to concentrate so that is one possibility the constructed notions or in subjection to an ethical reason you have an idea of what is good and what is evil you have an idea of what is virtue and what is sin but these are all artificial constructions because what is virtue in one country need not be virtue in another country okay it's very simple in some countries you have monogamy which is supposed to be a uh, a very virtuous affair in other countries you have polygamy <laughs> and that's also acceptable so these are all virtues sins good evil these are all very very ethical ideas which are very very artificial and that's why they are constructions in the mind and when you go up to a higher level they have no validity okay that's what he saying so the spiritual consciousness does not act according to our mental constructions and our ethical ideas ethical moral moral ideas working for a limited and fragmentary good so same thing is admitting that morality there is an element of goodness in it and the for the but it is limited and fragmentary it might and does admit 
things deemed by our reason irrational and unethical because that was necessary for the final and total good and for the working out of a cosmic purpose so that those things which we consider bad are also taken into consideration by the divine there is construction and dis- destruction all the time and we think that destruction is bad but there is nothing bad about it and when new construction has to take place there has to necessarily be a destruction before so that a new construction can take place so many um, examples are there a forest fire a flood it so destructive but it enriches the soil the floods then the forest fire the useless weeds and all that get destroyed and new life comes up so everywhere there is this process so what we consider sometimes that's why ramayan and mahabharat also there are many stories where even the avatars okay they are doing things which we consider to be sin but that's the whole idea that what you consider sin is not necessarily sin <laughs> it is seen from a totally different point of view okay i can steal something i can steal a a piece of bread that famous uh, uh, le miserable the story of le miserable you steal from the moral point of view it is very bad but my intention is i don't want to steal for myself i am going to feed a poor man intention is good <laughs> so it's not a bad thing at all it's very simple okay <laughs> fragmentary good it might and does admit things what is the it the spiritual consciousness things deemed by our reason irrational and unethical because that was necessary for the final and total good and for the working out of a cosmic purpose i take you back to the sentence where he says error is the handmaid of truth if you don't make a mistake then you will never know what the truth is if i have a i am going in a forest and there are two roads i go on one i find out it's a mistake i take the other one so i learn by mistakes all error is only a handmaiden he says of truth <laughs> so we should look down on failure we should look down on error okay so that's what he is saying what seems to us irrational or reprehensible in relation to a particular set of facts motives partial means. set partial set of facts what seems to us irrational or reprehensible in relation to a, yeah to a partial set a partial set of facts motives desiderata might be perfectly rational and approvable in relation to a much vaster motive and totality of data and desiderata so that which is desirable is desiderata is he has gone back to the desideratum desiderata that which is desirable okay so reason with its partial vis- vision sets up constructed conclusions which it strives to turn into general rules of knowledge and action and it compels into its rule by some mental device or gets rid of what it does not suit what does not suit it suit with it uh, that's it was english i am reading that sentence again reason with its partial vi- vision reason with its partial vision sets up constructed conclusions which it strives to turn into general rules of knowledge and action and it compels into its rule by some mental device or gets rid of what does not suit with it with the divine consciousness does not do it takes into consideration all the view points sometimes which we don't approve of we don't consider we throw it away <laughs> okay. does not suit with it an infinite consciousness would have no such rules it would have instead large intrinsic truths governing automatically conclusion and result but adapting them differently and spontaneously to a different total of circumstances so that 
by this pliability and free adaptation it might seem to the narrower faculty to have no standards whatever that's interesting we all morality and reason have standards it has to be logical it has to be moral but there there are no standards we can go back to that famous sentence of the gita okay it says sarva dharma an parityajya mam ekam sharanam braj give up all standards of conduct and depend on me alone so no standards of conduct at the highest level the divine decides for you what has to be done there is a, uh, an echo of that here in this one na adapting differently and spontaneously to a different total of circumstances so that by this pliability and free adaptation it might seem to the narrower faculty to have no standards whatever in the same way we cannot judge of the principle and dynamic operation of infinite being by the standards of finite existence what might be impossible for the one would be normal and self evidently natural states and motives for the greater freer reality it is for this that makes it in sorry it is this that makes the difference between our fragmentary mind consciousness constructing integers out of its fractions and an essential and total consciousness vision and knowledge it reminds me of uh, sir andos uh, support to the uh, british during the second world war all his life he fought against the british and suddenly when the war starts he starts supporting them there is a huge uh, hue and cry in in in, in the ashram what is sir and doing he is supporting the, the british but he could see from a higher point of view other things which the normal people could not see na no? he said there are bigger issues so he had to do that <laughs> so what knowledge is there actually in the world of any true value hardly <laughs> yeah in fact there is partial truths are there yes. and as we discussed at every level there are truths which are valid morality is valid if you are living in the body mind life it's valid but when you go above those standards go on changing it's very similar to laws in countries different countries different countries and different laws because they have different conditions na yeah? so different conditions different climate different plants different food everything is different so when you go from one level to another level it's like going from one country to another country they are changing so your question is what is the ultimate truth in the physical world there isn't any <laughs> there isn't any exactly so you have to go to get the highest one exactly. there are reflections of that mm-hmm. there are distorted reflections in the lower worlds no standard whatever in the same way we read that but i'm reading it again in the same way we cannot judge of the principle and dynamic operation of infinite being by the standards of finite existence what might be impossible for the one would be normal and self evidently natural states and motives for the greater freer reality it is this that makes the difference between our fragmentary mind consciousness constructing integers out of its fractions and an essential and total consciousness vision and knowledge so we are constructing trying to construct integers full numbers out of fractions <laughs> we are seeing only fractions we don't see the reality total reality <laughs> so it is not indeed possible so long as we are compelled to use reason as our main support for it to abdicate altogether in favor of an undeveloped or half organized intuition so without developing your mind you go to the higher level then there can be confusion you have to 
Double promotions are not possible. <laughs> That's what he's saying. Okay, sir. So, half organized intuition. So, but it is imperative on us in a consideration of the infinite and its being and action to enforce on our reason an utmost plasticity and open it to an awareness of the larger states and possibilities of that which we are striving to consider. It will not do to apply our limited and limiting conclusions to that which is illimitable if we concentrate only on one aspect and treat it as a whole, we illustrate the story of the blind men and the elephant. Each of the blind inquirers touched a different part and concluded that the whole animal was some object resembling the part of which he had had the touch. An experience of some one aspect of the infinite is valid in itself, but we cannot generalize from it that the infinite is that alone, nor would it be safe to view the rest of the infinite in the terms of that aspect and exclude all other viewpoints of spiritual experience. Okay, so what he's saying is very clear. Somebody sees that the physical world is unreal, it's okay for you, but that's not the only entire truth. Somebody else sees the personal aspect of the divine and says, that is the only truth. Not true. <laughs> you see the impersonal aspect of the divine and this many people say. Buddhists and uh, even Satguru says that. Uh, Jitu Krishnamurti says that. There is no God. There is no personal God. There are only planes of consciousness. Impersonal planes of consciousness. You get knowledge. There is love. There is freedom. There is peace. There may even be power, but there is nobody. <laughs> so, different things. So, what you experience one side, you insist that that's the only truth. So, there is warning against that. One eye and exclude all other viewpoints of spiritual experience. The infinite is at once an essentiality, a boundless totality, and a and multitude. So, What's he talking about? Essentiality, the highest level, transcendent. The boundless activity, the cosmic. And multitude, the individual. <laughs> the one, the many, and the three states. All, Brahman is all these things together. Not only that. He's not only transcendent. He's not only cosmic. He's not only individual. If you experience the divine within yourself, you feel that the divine is individual, that you feel that he is there within you. If you experience the divine in the cosmos, you end up with pantheism. And you think that that's the only truth. And you go to the transcendent, you see the impersonal aspect of the divine, you feel that that's the only truth. So all partial truth, that's what Swami is saying. <coughs> and exclude all others. The infinite is at once an essentiality, a boundless totality and a multitude. I am trying to see whether the image of the seed can uh, be helpful. The seed is essentially the tree and it can sprout and start having leaves and fruits and flowers and all that and finally it produces any number of fruits if you want. So in a certain sense you can you can say that. But actually he is referring here to the transcendent, the cosmic and the individual. <laughs> okay? So, all these have to be known in order to know truly the infinite. To see the parts alone and the totality not at all or only as a sum of the parts is a knowledge but also at the same time an ignorance. To see the totality alone and ignore the parts is also a knowledge and at the same time an ignorance. For a part may be greater than the whole because it belongs to the transcendence. To see the essence alone because it takes us back straight 
towards transcendence and negate the totality and the parts is a penultimate knowledge. But here too, there is a capital ignorance. A whole knowledge must be there and the reason must become plastic enough to look at all sides, all aspects and seek through them for that in which they are one. This last bit we will see again because we will identify each one what he is saying. To see the parts alone and the totality, not at all, or only a sum of the parts is a knowledge, but also at the same time an ignorance. So, to see the parts, take uh, medicine, okay? I see the stomach, I see the heart, I see the liver, I am seeing, and I am even seeing all the, and not the totality at all. Okay, that's what the specialist does. <laughs> he knows only about the heart, he knows nothing about the liver. He knows only about the brain, he knows nothing about the nerve system. So, that's a knowledge, but it's not a totality. You ignore the totality. But to see the totality without seeing the parts is also an ignorance, as we saying. The other example is also we can see when I am in the physical world here, I am seeing all these things. I am seeing you, I am seeing you, I am seeing you. I sit in a rocket and go up. I see the, I see the globe, but I don't see you anymore. <laughs> I see the totality, but I am not seeing the details. So that again is an ignorance. That's what he's saying. So you must be able to see both. You must be able to see the parts as well as the... So you must see the essentiality, you must see the totality, and you must also see the parts. That's why the philosophy is the integral philosophy. <laughs> That's what he said. Otherwise you know the divine only in parts. Okay? To see the totality alone and ignore the parts is also a knowledge and at the same time an ignorance. For a part may be greater than the whole because it belongs to the transcendence. To see the essence alone because it takes us back straight towards the transcendence and negate the totality and the parts is a penultimate knowledge. But here too, there is a capital ignorance. So, it's very clear what he's saying. You have to see all the things. Essentiality, totality and parts. Okay. A whole knowledge must be there and the reason must become plastic enough to look at all sides, all aspects and seek through them for that in which they are one. And what is that? That's the super mind. So, so long as you are in the Either in level 1, you are identified with body-mind life, or you are in level 2, the spiritual planes of consciousness, you are seeing only parts and partial truths. You go to the super-mind, you see all together. That's why he stress of going right up to the super-mind and manifesting it in the world. Thus too, if we see only the aspect of self, this theory, what he has discussed here, now he will apply to the Brahman, Purusha, Ishwara, Maya, Prakriti, Shakti. That's what he is going to do now. Thus too, if we see only the aspect of self, we may concentrate on its static silence and miss the dynamic truth of the infinite. I'll read the whole para and then we'll come back to it. If we see only the Ishwara, we may seize the dynamic truth, but miss the eternal status and the infinite silence, become aware only of dynamic being, dynamic consciousness, dynamic delight of being, but miss the pure existence, pure consciousness, pure bliss of being. If we concentrate on Purusha Prakriti alone, we may see only the dichotomy of soul and nature, spirit and matter, and miss their unity. In considering the action of the infinite, we have to avoid the error of the disciple who thought of himself as the Brahman, refused to obey the warning of the elephant driver to budge from the narrow path and was taken up by the elephant's trunk and removed out of the way. You are no doubt the Brahman, 
said the master to his bewildered disciple. But why did you not obey the driver Brahman and get out of the path of the elephant Brahman? <laughs> we must not commit the mistake of emphasizing one side of the truth and concluding from it or acting upon it to the exclusion of all other sides and aspects of the infinite. The realization, I am that, is true, but we cannot safely proceed on it unless we realize also that all is that. Our self-existence is a fact, but we must also be aware of other selves, of the same self in other beings, and of that which exceeds both own self and other self. The infinite is one in a multiplicity, and its action is only seizable by supreme reason which regards all and acts as a one awareness that observes itself in difference and respects its own differences, so that each thing and each being has its form of essential being and its form of dynamic nature, Swarupa Swadharma, and all are respected in the total working. The knowledge and action of the infinite is one in an unbound variability. It would be, from the point of view of the infinite truth, equally an error to insist either on a sameness of action in all circumstances or on a diversity of action without any unifying truth and harmony behind the diversity. In our own principle of conduct, if we sought to act in the greater truth, it would be equally an error to insist on our self alone or to insist on other selves alone. It is the self of all on which we have to found a unity of action and a total, infinitely plastic, yet harmonious diversity of action. For that is the nature of the working of the infinite. Yeah, it's a very interesting para. Uh, we can discuss in uh, quite a few things to be seen. So, thus too, I am reading from the beginning. Thus too, if we see only the aspect of self. So, let's get back to the concept of the self. What is the self? It's the Brahman. It's the Atman. It's the consciousness which feels itself to be in an immutable, featureless, infinite, eternal state. It cannot be described. It has no action. It is static. It is silent. But it is infinite and it has no features at all. You can't describe it in any way. But totally real. So real that everything else is unreal. Okay? So that's a self. You can call it the Brahman consciousness. You can call it the Atman. You can call the Buddhists call it Nirvana. The world disappears and you are in a consciousness which is absolutely real and static and featureless. That's the self. So if you have that experience, which Sri had and Buddha had and everybody had, so many people have, we may concentrate on a static silence and miss the dynamic truth of the infinite. The dynamic truth is the physical world where there is action going on all the time. So you are saying only spirit is real and the Dynamism in the physical world is a false, is a falsehood. So, so you are missing that. So you must have both. You must see the reality of both. Okay. And miss the dynamic of the infinite. If we see only the Ishvara, okay, that means the highest, we may see the dynamic truth and miss the eternal status and the infinite silence. If you see only the dynamic truth, you are saying the divine is governing, conducting the all the action in the physical world. You may miss the static condition. So that's what he say. <clears throat> okay. So become aware of only the dynamic being, dynamic consciousness, dynamic delight of being. 
this describes the physical world with all its action here so everything is dynamic in movement and you are not realizing that there is a static condition also you are saying only the river you are not seeing the origin of the river okay that's what is said and note also this dynamism is in being it's in consciousness and it's a delight of being satchidananda e c can become dynamic as well as static the being is this substance the substance can be absolutely like a sea at rest or the sea can produce waves then there is a consciousness which can be absolutely static or the consciousness can be moving and creative and force also is the same and anand also is the same okay if we concentrate on purusha prakriti alone we may see only the dichotomy of soul and nature spirit and matter and miss their unity he is talking of the sankhya philosophy when you go to the spiritual planes of consciousness the level 2 okay you see that there is a consciousness which is static that's a purusha and you see a force which is active in the physical world both are real but they seem to be separate they don't seem to have any connection even if there is a connection they are two and not one whereas the truth is that the highest level they are one satchitana chit shakti are one at the highest level that's the uh, symbolism of the ardhan arishwara they in our indian temples we have a figures where half male half female shakti and chit are one they are not separate at the highest level at the lower levels you see them as two separate things even in the physical world na there is a knowledge and will are separate knowledge is an aspect of chit and will is an aspect of force but they don't seem to always go together hand in hand i may have the knowledge of something but i may not have the will to do it i may have the will to do something i may not have the knowledge so that's exactly what he's saying okay so if you concentrate on purusha prakriti alone we may see only the dichotomy of soul and nature spirit and matter and miss the unity in considering the action of the infinite we have to avoid the error of the disciple who thought of himself as a brahman refused to obey the warning of the elephant driver to budge from the narrow path and was taken up by the elephant trunk and removed out of the way uh, this is an image which ramakrishna gave it is his image and uh, he explained this in this way so the disciple who is hurt because he is thrown by the elephant he goes back to his guru and tells him what did you teach me that everything is brahman so then the guru tells him you thought of yourself as the brahman but why did you think of the elephant also as the brahman and the elephant driver also as the brahman <laughs> so that's the totality okay sir you are no doubt the brahman said the master to his bewildered disciple but why did you not obey the driver brahman and get out of the path of the elephant brahman <laughs> we must not commit the mistake of emphasizing one side of the truth and concluding from it or acting upon it to the exclusion of all other sides and aspects of the infinite the realization i am that he is put in double quotes because that's a uh, upanishadic statement so ham asmi i am that and there is another one also which is tat tvamasi you are that and what is that god but when you use the word god it becomes personal so it is satchidananda god in the impersonal way that's what you are essentially okay is true but we cannot safely proceed on it unless we realize also that all is that not only i am that but you are also that and everything else also is that stones trees animals everything is also that okay and now he is saying something interesting uh the infinite is one in a multiplicity and its action is only seizable by a supreme reason which regards all and acts as one awareness as a one awareness and that observes itself in difference and respects its own 
differences. So, this is he is describing the second status of the super mind. The second status of the super mind is the first status is the sea is at rest. No movement, nothing. It's one. You see only the oneness. In the second status of the super mind, the sea starts making waves. But the waves are not waves, but swells only. You start seeing the beginning of movement and action and multiplicity. The third level is each wave is now forgetting that it is part of the sea. So he is referring to that. Okay. So there is a consciousness where you see the oneness, you see the whole sea and you see also the waves and you realize these are all waves of one sea. All bodies, your body, your body, my body, is all ultimately matter. So I am seeing that it is all this oneness, matter is the reality. But parts also, bodies also are real. So form is real and the origin of all forms also is real. That's what he is saying. Uh, which regards all and acts as, one, as a one awareness that observes itself in difference and respects its own differences. So, so that each thing and each being has its form of essential being and its form of dynamic nature, Swarupa and Swadharma. Now this is, we can have a brief discussion on Swarupa and Swadharma. Swarupa is... Swarupa, your own form, your own nature. So, that is, when the divine is creating, become, the one is becoming the many, he creates many souls. Each soul is essentially the divine, essentially the divine, but takes on a different nature. So, there are infinite natures. Each one has got a nature which is peculiar and singular only to himself. Your nature will not be replicated anywhere else in detail. So you are unique. It's one possibility of the infinite manifesting itself in the universe. That's your nature, Swarupa. But when you come down to the physical world, with that nature you have work to do here, that's your Swadharma. That's what you have to do. You have to know both. You must know what you are essentially and the work that you are doing here in the physical world. This idea of Swarupa and Swadharma is expressed in the um, in our Indian scriptures as the caste system. It's called the Varnashram. Okay? The, the thing is this. Different natures are there. Combination of the different natures. But if you ultimately see, it all boils down to only four. You can consider them only four, variations of four. One is the knowledge aspect. We are going back to the Satchidananda. Satchit Shakti Ananda. The four aspects. Satchit Shakti Ananda. So, you are going back to the origin of things. So, knowledge is one aspect of the divine. That's the Maheshwari aspect. Knowledge. It corresponds to the Brahmin. His work in the physical world is knowledge. Then there is the other aspect of force alone, Chit Shakti, and that's the Kshatriya. So these are the soul types. So that's it. There can be combinations and permutations, but these are the essential types. The other one will be neither knowledge nor force only, but wealth, production, beauty. Okay? That's a Vaishya. The one who produces wealth, okay, and uh, variety. So his nature would be one of generosity and going on creating wealth and splendor and beauty. That's a Vaishya. And finally, you have the aspect of modesty, service, okay, humility, and that's a Shudra. So all these can have a divine realization, and that's a Swabhava and the Swadharma. So the Swadharma boils down to these four, they can be infinite combinations of all these things. So that's the idea of Swabhava and Swadharma. You must know both. That's what I'm saying. Okay? It's interesting, we can immediately see that 
mother and son were both divine but did they have the same nature no mother was more into painting into music and shrimda was more into literature <laughs> literature poetry totally different okay so all respect in the total the knowledge and action of the infinite is one in an unbound variability so total freedom it would be from the point of view of the infinite truth equally an error to insist either on a sameness of action in all circumstances or on a diversity of action without any unifying truth and harmony behind the diversity so you feel that divine nature means everybody must be the same no not at all the divine can manifest himself in so many aspects that's what he is discussing okay he gives the example of the orchestra hundred instruments all playing different things but no disharmony at all perfect harmony <laughs> okay so equal energy insists on sameness of action in all circumstances or on a diversity of action without any unifying truth and harmony behind the diversity so there is the diversity and yet there is a oneness this is seen in all the species every species there is a oneness okay take the cat family catness is a oneness <laughs> but each cat is different different color different size different nature so that's what he saying you must have both okay in our own principle of conduct if we sought to act in this greater truth it would be equally an error to insist on our self alone or to insist on other self alone so on our self alone we are ignoring the others but the other thing that i am doing everything only for others and i reduce myself to a zero that also is wrong that's what he is saying in life divine he says in one place when you look at the universe you see yourself to be nothing just one small atom but it's equally a mistake to think that you are insignificant and you have no significance because you are the finite housing the infinite in yourself so you must take care of both yourself yes you must develop yourself but you must also see that others also are equally yourself when you have your cosmic consciousness so neither should be too self centered nor should you be too outward going that's what he saying so in truth it would be in our indian scriptures we have had examples of people who uh, go out of their way and demean themselves and say that only the other side is true and what others are saying is true and what i will do but that's a mistake you must also have your own fixity and your own uh, thing but you must not insist on it you must also be able to see other people's points of view <laughs> that's what he say in our own principle of conduct if we sought to act in this greater truth it would be equally an error to insist on our self alone or to insist on other self alone it is the self of all on which we have to found a unity of action and total infinitely plastic yet harmonious diversity of action harmonious diversity of action for that is the nature of the working of the infinite so two paras <laughs> we saw yes, here today i think so namaste all thank you ranga